This is Josh Baiser from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any suggestions for games you'd like me to look at here on the channel, please let me know. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Dissecting Design here on the YouTube channel. For this one, I am going with basically one of my holy grail video games. One of my all-time personal favorites. This is Rise of Nations. The extended edition basically means this is the um, modern, I guess, remake or modern version of the game that was released on Steam a few years ago. But the original version came out, I believe, in the I want to say late 90s, early 1000s. It seems like it's been ages, no pun intended. And this, my friends, is an amazing strategy game. And I am honestly surprised that more strategy game developers didn't look to Horizon Nations and took notes on its development. Before we get into the game, it's important to go over a little bit of the backstory. Rise of Nations was developed by Brian Reynolds from his studio Big Huge Games. And for those of you who don't know, Brian Reynolds originally worked at Fraxis being, I think, a part of the early Civilizations games, and his biggest claim to fame at that time was being the designer behind Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. And that, if you don't know that game, or if you're too young to play that, that's another one of those holy grail video games for a lot of people, especially strategy fans. Maybe at some point we'll take a look at that on this series. But following his time at Firaxis, he formed Big Huge Games, and he wanted to create a strategy game that was a little bit different. He wanted to take the slower pacing and the, I guess, more decision-making of a turn-based strategy game, but coupled it with the real-time uh, pacing and, you know, you know, faster speeds of a real-time game. And what he ended up creating with Rise of Nations was a game that really stood out compared to the other strategy games at the time, specifically Command and Conquer and StarCraft. And what we're going to show tonight is how he did, or how he and his team really went with a different feel to it, and why it really hasn't been emulated since, or not at least in, in an all-encompassing point of view. But I know you're tired of hearing me talk just in front of this title screen, so we're going to get in-game. But we'll be coming back to this probably in a few minutes to talk about one of the best things Rise of Nations did. But anyway, I'll see you all in a second. Alright, we are officially in-game. Just one second, I just want to make sure that we are actually recording this. And for the purpose of this video, I have turned off the AI. Because trying to talk about the game while playing the game while dealing with AI may be a little too much for me. But first thing you'll notice is that this looks very much like your traditional strategy game. We have a home city, we have resources ticking in at the top, and we have a big old map to explore. But as we'll get in, you're going to know some major differences. first thing is that the game similar to Civilization is all about aging up. As we go up in age, places get more modern, and we'll get access to newer units. Now there are a lot of factions in Rise of Nations compared to other real-time strategy games, and the reason for this is that each faction basically has two unique bonuses. First they have a set of passives, as you can see at the bottom left. And these passives exist throughout the entire game. Then there are unique military units. And that's kind of the other interesting twist of Rise of Nations. While we're doing this, I just want to let you notice that it actually tells me the peak amount of workers or villagers I need for each resource station. And that's a really nice touch. But let me wrap that up and we'll get started. You can see the number, our infrastructure right there. Our commerce limit basically determines how much of each resource we can make at a single time. So let me build a barracks. Actually, we need to unlock our first research. Now one thing that I also want to point out while we're doing this is that first off, you notice that there is a zone of control. And what that is, is as we 
expand our civilization with more towns and such, our zone of control dictates where we can build inside that territory. But more importantly, we can actually unlock a resource, which I will do that right now, or a tech, that what this effectively does is it makes it so that anyone who enters our territory who isn't a friend will take damage over time. And that is huge as a real-time strategy game. Traditionally, rushing or the act of building a lot of units early on at the expense of an economy to overwhelm your opponent is an always viable strategy. Here, with the idea of taking this damage over time, which will get those resources in a, or that research in a second, it essentially is a direct counter for it and provides players who boom or turtle a comparative advantage or a comparative option. Now here we have like random special resources similar to civilization that give us bonuses. Now as we unlock more researches in this row, the other ones will get cheaper. But it will get more and more as we go up. And as we go up in ages, new resources will be unlocked, which will then basically get um, intersected or integrated into everything that we do. So at the start, our military units just cost food and wood or food and gold or any combination like that. But once we unlock stuff like stone or oil as we get later in, that will play a major part. And also, if you notice here, we have wonders as well. And just like in Civilization, you can build wonders, and whoever gets to it first gets that super bonus. And the other way to win the game is by rushing, or I'm sorry, by getting all the wonders. So here we have Attrition, which will unlock once we un get level 1 in Civic. And each one of these four categories basically does something for your Civilization. Military raises our population limit and unlocks new units. Civics let us build new cities and get taxes and such. The commerce line raises our resources that can come in. And then science lets us unlock new upgrades. And it should also provide some additional bonuses as well, as you can see. And again, it is possible to research all the tech without aging up if you just want to focus on food and wood or whatever. But the catch of that, and just like in Civilization, is if you start to fall behind when it comes to your, your Civilization or your age, you're going to run into that classic situation of tank versus horseman. And just like in Civilization, there is a penalty for fighting higher age units. So if I'm still using spearmen and my enemy's using marines, we're basically in deep trouble. As you can see, another thing that the game does is that it forces you to expand. Because there is a limit of how much you can farm in a single city, how many workers effectively can work there. And part of the challenge of that of the game is building out, building close to major resources, which as you can see our little friend there is hopefully finding for us, and then trying to hopefully age up and get more powerful. So I'm going to build some military units. And the interesting thing about Rise of Nations is that every faction gets access to the same basic pool of units. So you have light infantry, heavy infantry, and foot archers. And we'll eventually lock some heavy archers as well. You can see they're in like little stacks of three. But each specific country or each specific civilization also gets special variants at specific times. So as the Persians, I get the immortals instead of getting kind of like normal spearmen. Well, that means that these guys are going to be better than their basic versions, which in this case will be the Hoplites. And then they may offer special bonuses, but typically, as a rule of thumb, you're going to try and build yourself up through... You're trying to try and capitalize on when your military is at its strongest. So right now, this will be a good time for me to be aggressive in the early ages when I have access to these guys. And you can see at the bottom it says that they're weak against archers, 
So what that would mean is typically I would build some slingers because they are the direct counter. Another thing you can set up uh, groups, which if I can let's see, can I show it on the UI? Well, we'll actually show it there, but here's the part that I love. You should be able to set recon to a specific faction, if I remember right. It has been a very long time since I've played this game. Here we can zoom in a little bit. So I will set this up like that. Click on that unit, and now they will automatically join, and they will automatically be added to my group here. So as you can see, it works like that. And you can also set characters up in formation. As another interesting touch, in the combat of the game, again you can see everyone forming up, if someone's attacking multiple, if four or five guys are basically attacking the same unit, there is an attack penalty to represent the fact that basically all the shots are like careening into each other. This is to prevent one of the most common strategies of real-time strategy games, and that is to essentially control or focus fire on a single unit to try and kill them and kill the army quicker. In this way, it's more about armies raging war and getting flanking. And this is just another way that Brian Reynolds and Big Huge Games essentially try to combat the traditional real-time strategy tactics and methods. So this should be getting done. I know I am talking a lot as we're trying to go through. So I will build a second city or get the research and will also begin to unlock the classical age. And again, I am not playing this optimally. There is just no way to talk and break this game down at the same time. So we'll unlock upgrades that will raise our borders, and basically everything within the border we can effectively mine, or research, or I'm sorry, exploit. So I will now take one of my guys, and we need to build a second city. And again, the further we make it, the more, up here's another resource, the more our borders will expand. So we're now in age two, and as you can see we can now upgrade our units. When we upgrade them, it will basically raise their base stats, and all of our existing units will convert to it. So we'll build that, because as you can see, we're starting to get close to the 70 cap. New upgrades will be unlocked very soon. Here's the university. This will let us build research, and research will begin to factor into how we upgrade, as you can see right there. But again, there is a limit of how much you can build in a single city, and that was an explicit choice. They wanted to make it so that the cities very much become build and forget in a sense. Once you've added in everything that goes in that city, you can basically leave it alone. So what I'm going to do is build my second city right there. We'll add some scholars, which we definitely need some more wealth. To do that, we'll build a marketplace, and we have a few wonders available. And again, whoever builds it first wins. So another thing to keep in mind is, every time I build something, and keep an eye on that resource right here for food and wood. Every time I build a military unit, or any unit at all, the price for each successive unit goes up. This is again to combat rushing, and to again force you to upgrade yourselves and get more powerful. So since we upgraded to the classical age, we now, as you can see, need another resource. We need metal, and metal will be coming from our mountains. So. And again, you can see as we go to different resources or different uh, sources on the map, it will tell us how many villagers can actually work there and the most amount of resources we'll gain. So one of the reasons why I wanted to build like right around here is that there's more lumber. And let me see here. We also have idle citizen bonuses. 
So now I'm going to build a caravan, and the caravan will automatically go out to our cities and basically earn us gold. Oh yeah, that's right, because I'm Persian, I should get a bonus for caravans. So now I will send these five guys over here. They will start mine. Once they get there, this will shot up from plus 10 every 30 seconds to plus 50, which again is because we can only use 5. And the basic concept is that while it is important to set up multiple buildings, multiple barracks, stuff like that, once you've settled on like your basic city, you can build military buildings just about anywhere. Once you've gotten the basics down, you really won't need to touch these cities anymore. You may need like a few villagers on standby like if you want to build a wonder or stuff like that. But this isn't like StarCraft or other ones where you're going to be constantly going back and forth making sure your buildings are doing stuff, stuff like that. Now the sand is a option that was added in later with the first expansion that adds in government settings. Now I've settled the merchant went here and now we have this passive bonus. So I'm going to cut the video here. I'm going to do some more building on my hen, probably get us a little bit more aged up. But actually before I do that, I want to show you what happens when we upgrade. So let me zoom in here. You can see our immortals. And I will try, I will not be pronouncing that because I will pretty much butcher that name. But watch what happens when we hit 100%. And again, the game does a really good job of showing you all the information that you need at a chosen time. Oh, there you go, the model change. They've upgraded. Now one thing that I can do is raise the text up. And this should give us more information, as you can see right there. And this is a great strategy or great tip for expert players, so they can see exactly what's going on. I want to set back down to medium, just so that it makes it easier. So I'll be doing some building up right now, and I will catch you all in a minute. All right. And while it has been probably a few seconds since you last heard of me, I've been playing for like the last five or ten minutes trying to build things up. And we're just at the point of that one of the major tipping areas of Rise of Nations, and that is advancing from the pre-modern era to the modern era. While I'm finishing things up here, I just want to go over a little bit more of the unique things Rise of Nations did. So, the first thing is, besides building the resource producers like farms, lumberyards, etc., you can also build resource enhancers. These are things like the granaries, lumber mills, smelters, and what they simply do is increase the output of that specific resource in the city. So if I have a city that has a lot of lumber, I definitely want to build the lumber yard and make things better. Also, I've built a few of the wonders. And again, these wonders, once they've been built, remain until the end of the game or if someone destroys them or conquers your city. And over here, that I just want to cancel. There we go. And again, as you can see, I've hit the resource cap quite a bit <laughs> over there, a lot of blinking lights. Now, because I am the Persians, again, my other unique unit is instead of regular cavalry units, I can build war elephants. And then we have siege units up here. Now, another thing that's very important about Rise of Nations, especially if we were doing more military, are sea or supply wagons. What they do is they provide you with basically a zone of protection against attrition. So if you, we look right here, any units that are in that field are immune to attrition. And also supply or siege units will attack faster. So it's important to have several of these in place because if you lose one in enemy territory, you're going to get hurt. Fortresses allow you to build spies and generals. Spies basically let you do secret things like this. And generals provide you with bonuses during combat. And they can also use special abilities as well. Now, as I was saying at the last part of the previous section, I can also create a government. And this was added in with the expansion. 
the government basically lets you do bonuses whether they go with economy or military and you get a different leader from it so this is a way of you basically further defining how you want to build your strategy do you want to focus on more resources and higher commerce for rush i'm sorry for booming or do you want to get better military get quicker and just try and defeat your enemy with sheer numbers so as you can see we have my military here i will add you guys there we have siege or artillery and I have some cavalry as well there is a pretty sizable flanking bonus and that's what you use cavalry for for the most part you know your main force will engage and then you'll have your cavalry come around and basically try and attack the enemy from the back in artillery you just want to keep away from anything that can rush it because they will die fairly quickly again we have some more of that Another thing that's really great about Rise of Nations is the hotkey selectors. And I will be showing that off in probably the next section of this video. Oh, and there's also naval units. Here's another wonder, the Forbidden City. But I think it's time we put away our sticks and stones and uh, bows and arrows and get some guns, don't you think? So we're going to go up to the Industrial Age. And this is the, like I said, the one of the big points of the game. We're no longer going to be dealing with these regular units. Things are going to become a lot more streamlined, but our options are going to increase. And you'll see that once our little resource is done there. While I'm waiting, what I can also do, oh my goodness, I have so many <laughs> cities now. And again, one of the things I like is that these cities become very much self-contained. They all basically work themselves once those buildings are done. I don't need to deal with these guys anymore. Research is universal to that building type. So we're almost there. So one last thing we can build is a naval yard. Let us build fishing ships and get fishing or sea resources as well. Like over here. Oh, we're almost there. Hope everyone's on the edge of their seats. And... There we go. We are officially in the modern era. Horses are going to be going away now. And the final major resource has been unlocked, and that's oil. So as you can see, I did this on purpose, but generally you want to be upgrading your military units keeping with the age but in order to show off this uh, very drastic change we're going to transform actually first off let me get our military to this level we're going to show off our guys being replaced so another thing we need to do now is set up for oil and oil will be used for the end game units so all my civilians who are just hanging around not doing anything, we need oil. That will be for a work boat. Again, you can see it all lit up on the map to let us know where our oil supplies are. Alright, so the research is done. So what's going to happen now is all of our inventory are going away. And that means all of our special ones as well. So the Persian Uniques will no longer be in this game because we're beyond their age. So I'm going to zoom on in. And our guys with our slingers and spears are about to get some modern day equivalents. Alright, there's one. So now we have riflemen. And riflemen are the generic infantry units at this age. If we were playing the United States, I believe we get the Marines instead. So these guys should be replaced with anti-tank weapons. Any second now? And... There we go. Now my resource, or research is still lacking, so let's get that going. Our trebuchets are about to become tanks, or I'm sorry, about to become cannons. We can now build anti-aircraft weapons, and that's actually very important. 
You can also see we have machine guns. So they're good against rifles, not good against tanks. These guys are good against tanks, but weak against uh, infantry. And these guys are just all badass around infantry, but fail against vehicles. We even have flamethrowers who are good against buildings as well. So you can see our artillery is now upgraded. And the next level will get even more. But as you can see, military has been changing quite dramatically. And what I will also do, if I can find my stables, there they are. The stables have now become an auto plant. Because unfortunately, while elephants are nice in the old days, they don't really do all that much against uh, heavy metal. So now our, sadly our Persian elephants here will have to say goodbye. While that's going on, we'll get these resources going. And as you can see, we have oil coming in. All right, elephants. It's been nice having you here, but you gotta go. <laughs> Let's not think about how that transition happened, folks. So again, we need more oil. This is done, so we can create work boats, I believe. Or actually, I'm sorry, one of the most awesome things that Rise of Nations does is eliminate one of the more micro-intensive aspects of naval battles. It's having to build transport units. What happens is if I move any military or any unit into the water, it will transform into a transport boat for that unit. So watch. I hope this works, so I'm going to be dumb. Oh, there we go. Now, this transport unit is very weak, and there are any... Um, offensive naval units nearby, they will destroy them quickly and kill those units. But this allows military to quickly transition into transporting across the water and allows to avoid that period of, oh no, the enemy is surrounded by water, now I gotta spend five minutes building transport vehicles. So we're doing really well on that regard, but as you can see, we really need oil. should probably build that as well and also while that is going on I will also build one of the final things well we get missiles too oh, we'll, we'll be showing that off in a little bit but you can also build aerial units and air units in Rise of Nations basically counter just about everything on the ground except for specific anti-air weapons so you can see everything is moving along. We'll get that going. I probably need more oil. And again, if we were playing against an AI or another player, we would basically be um, jockeying for any oil that's on the map. Because that's the only way we'll be able to build our tanks and advance up in age. So there's more researches to do. And again, just keep on getting that oil all right the air is done so we have different kinds of units there are those that are used for scouting some that go on missions you basically send them to attack and then they return and then you have air units that just become a part of your traditional infantry I'm sorry part of your traditional military so we can advance to the modern age now and also by fully upgrading, as you can see, we've gotten some a whole lot more vision on the map. So as you can see, by getting to level 6, the entire map is open. We see the entire land structure. Once we get to level 7, we see everything in our territory. So the second an enemy comes in, we know where he's at. And then we go up and up and up. And of course, if I want to also win or hunker down, we could build more of these structures. So because I am hurting, oh, we can even make our supply units heal. As I was saying, because we're hurting for oil, we could build the Eiffel Tower once we hit the modern error. 
But again, as you can see, we are doing really, really well for just about all of our resources. So let me, oh, there we go. No more uh, stone roads for us. Now, where are my, there we go, my farms. Now, you can actually sort to them. Is that right? Oh, this just sorts all research buildings. So any building that can't have research to going, this will just auto sort. Won't do this anymore because we don't have anything. That'll go straight to the library. And then once you get to the final age, information age, you unlock nuclear missiles. And then once all the research is done, you unlock super researches. These are basically the end game game enders, essentially. They will let you see everything, get massive resources, and even get a nuclear shield to protect you from missiles. So we can probably get that going once we've unlocked that. But just to show it off, I can now build missile silos. And you can build regular missiles, or you can build uh, the big ones, the nukes. So again, we have new tanks. We're at full commerce, which what that means right now is I should not build any more farms, mines, or marketplaces, or I'm sorry, or temples, because I literally am not bringing in any more money, because this is our cap right now. Now, apparently we have a bonus for research, probably from some of my wonders or bonus resources. So we have regular missiles, or we can upgrade to nuclear missiles. I think nuclear missiles are nice. What about you? And as a fun thing about Horizon Nations, once nuclear missiles come into play, what ends up happening is each time they're launched, a doomsday clock begins and if it fills up everybody loses so it's kind of a fun way of you know if I can't win no one can win kind of situation now again we are still hurting for oil and that's kind of where things get challenging but this is why you build refineries and you build one in each one of your cities to get that bonus so you go here if we look at our resource or our researches, we are getting quite done there. Not much more we can do. It's just all about waiting. So let me see if there's any other wonders we can build. But we will probably be cutting this video in like the next few seconds. Because there's one other thing that I want to talk about that you may have been seeing slightly as I've been playing. But I want to bring it to everyone's attention as one of the most genius things Big Huge Games did with Rise of Nations. And then after that, we will be talking about the other unique thing they did when it came to single player content as a way of providing a different change of pace from traditional skirmish maps. But let me see, are my nukes done? Or actually, can I build anything else? We have Wonders, the Space Program. Look at that, you can see everything on the map. This one, Technologies can be researched instantaneously. That ain't bad either. Nope. There we go. Sometimes it gets stuck, I notice. So we can advance to the final age. And now my silo can build nuclear missiles, and then we can build even stronger <laughs> nuclear missiles. Because of course, why not, right? But I'm going to cut things here because we need to go back to the menu to talk about another great part of Rise of Nations. All right, we're back at the menu, and I know this isn't the most exciting thing to watch, especially for strategy game fans, but there is one thing about Rise of Nations I want to point out as just brilliance, and this is a great example of having a strong foundation to your game and how much it can really improve things going forward. 
And I've talked about this before on posts on Game Wisdom, but I want to show this off. And this is what makes Rise of Nation such a great game. Hotkeys. Hotkeys as far as the eye can see. And I know what you're thinking right now. What is the big deal about this? Why should we care about hotkeys like showing the data of cities, advanced menus, and stuff like this? The reason is that the hotkey list basically goes over anything and everything you will ever need while you're playing the game. If I want to automatically tell my workers to build farms, I can do that. If I want to look at researches or build military units while I'm focusing on combat, I never have to return to my cities. I can simply click on the button to find it, which if I can find, here we go, I can simply click on K and I will find, I will go to each one of my barracks and tell them to build. Or what if I need a standing order? What if I have an emergency and I want everything to produce military units? Well, I can select all my barracks with a with two button presses and issue orders that way. And this is just a great way of letting the player essentially focus on playing the game instead of fighting the UI. One of the things that drove me crazy trying to learn or trying to play StarCraft II was how lacking it was in useful hotkeys. Because it was so micro-intensive, Blizzard, at, at least when I played it at the release, really left a lot of information on the main screen without using effective hotkeys. And this made it very frustrating for me to play the game. One of my favorite abilities is to set rally points to command groups. And Rise of Nations, at least from my experience, is the first RTS to do that. And that, my friends, is something that should be standard in any real-time strategy game. Is just that simple functionality. And what all this does goes back to, again, Big Huge Games, I guess, mission statement for Rise of Nations. They want you to focus on playing the game and not being micro-intensive. So there are very few special abilities Everything is key, or everything is tuned to hotkeys, and it's more about basically playing the overall map rather than individual battles. So unlike other real-time strategy games like StarCraft, Command Conquer, and so on, where battles become about essentially playing footsies with the enemy army, you know, moving back, shooting, moving back, shooting, it's more about, I'm going to let my military do their thing, and I'm going to focus on something else. Again, the most advanced combat maneuvers in Rise of Nations outside of aerial units and missiles are flanking attacks. And that's to be good, because it's something that, it's not really micro-intensive, but it can mean the difference in the world. Again, just look at all these damn hotkeys in this game. And again, if you're watching this right now, no one is going to use all these hotkeys, unless we're talking about, excuse me, professional Rise of Nations, you know, competitive players. But the options are there, and even if you just learn simple ones, like select all barracks, immediately go to research, or go to the next research needing building. Like here's one for universities. I can just click on that and tell all my universities to do something. Find idle citizens, find my generals, and let's see, build a library. So this will be once if I'm selecting a civilian or a citizen. But like here's why I can click on this to so automatically research the next age. And so on. again, I I've completely forgotten what most of these hotkeys are. But I can come here, and more importantly, I can set my own. And of course, if I need to reset defaults, I can do that. So let's say, for instance, that I just really want the ones about finding militaries. I could set them all up to like ASD on the keyboard, so I can just keep my fingers there, and immediately be able to select all my buildings along that front. And like I said, this doesn't sound all that impressive, and for most of you watching this, you're probably going, who cares? But this is the kind of stuff that it makes it easier to play your game. It adds a lot of quality of life features. And it's just all around a great thing. 
So again, here are the buildings. We can break it down by listing here. Library commands, find a unit or building. Again, just very easy to lay it all out here. So where was my library? There it goes, find library L, select all, select the library without zooming to it. Again, just a very powerful set of tools to make your life easier. And it's as simple or as complex as you want it to be. And like I said, if you're new to the game, you're probably not going to look at that screen. If you're an expert player, you're going to dig into that and set things up to exactly how you want it. Now with that said, there's one more thing I want to talk about with Rise of Nations. We're going to look at how the game sets things up for its solo campaigns. And that is the Conquer the World mode. So the Conquer the World basically has different campaigns set in different periods with unique rules that go with it. So I'm going to select one of these and I will see you all in a second. Alright, so here we are in the game's uh, single player campaign and it's called the Conquer the World campaign. There are several ones based on different periods as you saw at the end of the last part. And what this was, is was a way of having a grand strategy to a single player RTS. So this is the first one. We're playing as Alexander the Great. So we have different victory conditions, special abilities, and we basically have unique considerations. So as Alexander, we're not allying with anyone. We want to rule the world. And we're not going to have any patriots or a senate because Alexander wants to be king of everything. So how it works is, and we're not going to go through this because we'll be here for who knows how long, is each one of our generals here, or our armies, we move them and this will set us up for a RTS battle. So there's our army. So if I move him over here, we would attack these guys. We move up here, we go there, and the number here represents how strong the territory is. So obviously, if we're right now at three, we probably don't want to attack anything too crazy. Now down here, you can see our resource rate and bonuses that we get from wherever we've conquered. And then we can use these bonus cards during a battle to gain additional bonuses, but they can only be used once. So now it may be hard to see. I'm trying to show there's sometimes it tells you exactly kind of like the order in terms of history of what you conquered. You can see it on the right, it tells us a little bit about what will happen when we go there. So right now our priority is to stop the rebellions in, what was that, Thrice? Thrace and Greece. So you can see the different capitals. And we defeat a capital, we gain a special bonus, which you can see over there, the Oath of Fealty. And this is just a way of attaching a persistent element to these traditional uh, separate single player matches. So again, I am free to attack whoever I want. And as we attack, when we win a territory, we gain these resources. And then that will be available for all future battles. So it basically pays to go for the bonuses and then have those as a way of tilting the scales in our favor for when we attack some of the major ones. Now supply basically lets us have another army on the field. Because traditionally I can only attack where my army is. So if I move over here, I can't move anyone, I really can't get back over here. But if I conquer this one first, then I'm going to start pushing out in both ways. And as you can see, we only have 18 turns before the campaign ends. And basically, we can only attack once per turn, and everyone does their own thing. Now, wonders over here. We need to conquer, we need to build those cards, or use them, or conquer territories that have wonders, like over here, in order for them to count. And again, this is a simple campaign. As you can see, we're not dealing with a huge... 
uh, span of land. But if I chose the Cold War, that would be another story altogether. So what I will do just to show it off is we'll move over here. We click start and then we go into the actual battle. And then if we win, it becomes part of our territory. We get those bonuses. If we lose, we get pushed back to the map. The turn ends and we go forward. So for this one, I have 18 turns. I need to conquer all the major nations. And of course, they'll be trying to do things as well. So as you can see, Persia over here and the Indians are going to probably be our two biggest threats. While Rome and the Egyptians are going to kind of be, you know, stepping stones, if you will, towards our grand mastery of the world. Again, we can't really do diplomacy because we are Alexander the Great. But we could do stuff like this in other plays, you know, offer things up to join us and stuff like that. But we'll end things here. So I'm going to head back to the main menu for final thoughts and then we'll say goodbye. To wrap up our little dissecting design for today, Rise of Nations was a very big success among strategy fans. They loved the idea of, again, playing a real-time game or real-time strategy, but having some of the decision-making and slower pace that we normally see to turn-based games. And like I said, it afforded them one expansion and it put big, huge games on the map. Sadly, their follow-up, Rise, Rise of Legends, well, wow, sorry, did not do well. And there's probably a dissecting design, or at least I think I did a critical thought talking about how that game kind of slipped up. They took a lot of the things that made Rise of Nations unique and removed or downplayed them to make it more like a traditional RTS. In terms of Rise of Nations Legacy, we did see other strategy games adopt some of the minor things, such as improved hotkeys and uh, quality of life features. If you want like another strategy game or RTS like Rise of Nations, there are few and far between. The Empire Earth series would probably be the closest to Rise of Nations, but it never got as many accolades from what I saw despite the pedigree of the studio and what they are trying to accomplish. For any RTS fans watching this video, did you play the Empire Earth series and what did you think of it? Because I heard a lot of interesting things. They did some very different things with the series as it went forward, including having picture-in-picture -picture functionality for mini-maps, going literally from the Stone Era to giant robots and spaceships. It just got crazy. And then one of the Empire Earth games, I think, downplayed things and gave like more like special features, became more micro-focused, stuff like that. But... Sadly for now, Rise of Nations exists as a footnote in the RTS history, but is still an impressive game. I'm sure there are still people playing it today, and I have a friend who we like to do AI comp stomps against. But that's going to do it for this video, so thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this little history lesson on RTS design. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe, of course. And if you have any other games you would like me to look at in this video series, please let me know in the comments below. But otherwise, that's going to do it. So be sure to check back daily for more great content here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. And these dissecting design videos will be going up at least once a week. So until next time, have a great night. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.